Steve Coakley, and he was explaining about the boule, you know what I'm saying? Secret society of black people or black men, really, that um, plays second fiddle to white folks, you know what I'm saying? And get urged for um, fame and prestige. And as you say, he brought up Monrovia, Liberia, which is the story is about on this one, because as he said before, you had to have the boule in, in Monrovia, Liberia, to stop Marcus Garvey. Let's continue on reading on this. This is part two of what happened when, you know, Liberia shunned Marcus Garvey and they stuck with Firestone. And we already did a part one, which is this on here. And this is part two of the video. A century of blood, sweat, and profits. As you see right here, we got a, um, a young African brother with a knife cutting the sap, get the rubber out, you know. 
That's how they do it. You know what I'm saying? It was very, very good and work. Still is to this day. They still do the same way. So understand the ferocity of fighting that erupted in the 90s. And why fire on this plantation then became the central in it? One needs to know something about a Liberia's unusual history. The country was settled in the 1800 by free born African American blacks and free American slaves. The result of a, of a back to Africa movement by the coloniz American Colonization Society, a philanthropic organization, and it was supported by James Monroe in the United U.S. Congress. James Monroe, in this case, you know, he was a big slave trader. Even after the colony declared itself independent in 1847, named itself Liberia, or land of freedom, the country duplicated many of the economic and social structures of the American South. The settlers, known as American Liberians, had a complex relation with the indigenous Africans who lived in the region. Some of the settlers built Southern Styles mansions and exploited local blacks for low labor and land. Um, I got a on sidebar note. I got a video about Alexander Great, Honorable Alexander Cromwell. And he talks about this. If you read Alexander Cromwell works, he talks about this, saying that you know the Americans that went back to Africa, the Black Americans, were so indoctrinated with the white man and shit like that that they just kept on copying his ways. You know what I'm saying? They became the slave masters over their people in the name of Christianity. You know what I'm saying? Under the guise of Christianity. So we're gonna continue that. And I can tell you, you know, that was a really a big, big black scar for Liberia because black, the Africans that came from America came back over would exploit and use them as slaves. True story, real talk. It shocked me too when I found out about it. Back to the subject. Firestone arrived in Liberia in the 1920s. By that time, Harvey S. Weinstone Sr., the farm boy from Ohio who founded Firestone Tire and Rubber Company had become one of the top industrials of the Gilded Age. He dreamed of finding a rubber source beyond the grass of British Empire, which controlled much of the world market. In Liberia, he found a spot in a narrow band around the equator where rubber trees thrived and the nation was indebted and desperate for business. After two years of negotiation, Liberia announced one of the, the history's greatest sweetheart deal. Liberia gave Firestone a right to lease the land up to a million acres Roughly 10% of the country's arable land for cost six cents an acre return 90 years, 99 years. You know what I'm saying? So the um deal we what is about 2019 now. So the deal is about to run out pretty soon. You know what I'm saying? The deal survived early controversy in 1930 when investigators from the League of Nations found officials in the Liberian government had engaged in forcing indigenous villages to work on private farms, including the Firestone Plantation. Now, when Firestone was dealing with the people, we're gonna find out. I ain't gonna, we're just gonna keep on reading. The investigators found no evidence Firestone consciously employed labor which had been forcibly impressed. Soon after the scandal, Harvey Firestone Jr., the father of the son, launched a public relations campaign delivering a series of radio address that described the company work in Liberia. Five minutes past depicted the company that respected local customs, provided workers with health care, and built roads from a benign nation, all while benefiting American car owners. And as we talked about, sidebar quick on this one, as we talked about the American car owners, Firestone and Ford was connected. So these rubber plants, these rubber was being provided tires for Ford. You know what I'm saying? And as I discussed in the first part of the video, uh, Henry Firestone and, and then Ford's you know what I'm saying? For his family, they married together. So it was a marriage, you know, it was a business marriage, basically. Still own the Detroit Lions and all type of stuff like that. The football, the American football team. To the little public of right beer, Firestone has brought a new day of hope and advancement. Firestone said in one broadcast, it has been gratifying thought into thought of us by means of commercial progress. We have been a service to mankind. The 50s are also golden years of Firestone and the Liberian elite. The Liberian elite, as we talked about again, is the boule that the Honorable Steve Copley talked about, our ancestor. Firestone was Liberia's largest private corporate employer and the largest exporter in the country. Firestone private after taxes amounted to three times the government total rate removal in 1951, according to one study. The company tightened its relationship with the country's ruling class in part by helping them become 
rubber farmers and we're buying free saplings in agriculture advice. When rubber began to flow, Firestone purchased it. Former presidents, pay attention now, former presidents Charles King, Edwin Barclay, and William B. S. Tubman in Tover were all large rubber plantations, our own large rubber plantations. These names I named over Joe Boulay in my in Morovia, Liberia, the former presidents. And they all own large rubber plantations. To preserve, in, in the slave, they own people. To preserve the plantation, Firestone worked closely with whoever ran Liberia, no matter how they came to power or what they did to hold it. In almost nearly 30 years, Thurman turned a, into a virtual dictator, squashing dissent, imprisoning political opponents, and creating a spy network to track ordinary citizens. Fire Maystone maintained such close ties with him that when his daughter, one of the plantation executive, got married, she and her husband honeymooned at Tubman's summer retreat outside of Morovia. Colbert, Tubman's longtime vice president's successor, had the most fractious relationship with the rubber giant. As the president in the mid 1970s, he renegotiated the government contract with Firestone, insisting on raising the taxes and hiring more Liberians and senior management. Firestone is expected to complain when the plantation probability begins to decline. About four weeks after Doe's bloody coup in 1980, Firestone said Don L. White, an affable executive in charge of the company, will oversee the rubber operation to meet the new dictator. When you're the big frog in the pond, you're sort of welcoming, wondering who was in charge of the pond, White explained. Doe suspended the 1976 rubber deal struck by Tober that has so pain Firestone executives. Until world rubber prices rebounded, he decided that the company would enjoy the generous tax exemption. Firestone and Liberian has enjoyed a long and unique historical relationship, Doe said in a speech to Firestone executive. You therefore consider this relationship as a contract of survival. Taylor and Sue ensured that Doe's role in the relationship would be limited. Tough talk in the jungle. As you see here, this is Charles Taylor. We discussed him before, you know what I'm saying? He's from my beard, but he was in Boston. He was locked up in Boston, Massachusetts, and somehow he escaped, which he said he escaped through the help of the CIA. We talked about that in the last video, or part one. You know, he's supposed to be the so-called savior of Liberia, you know, with CIA backing and um, French intelligence backing. After Jason Firestone managed out the house June 1990, Taylor took over the colonial grandeur of House of 1953. The message was unmistakable. The company had dominated the country for so long and held power as leader in his labor had been vanquished. The stately mansion was often chaotic and frenzy. Cronies and bodyguards lounged in the hallways. Sacrifice waiting for an audience. Battle commanders rushed in and out. Taylor's goal was to seize Monrovia, which held half of the country's population and most of its financial and political institutions, and most important, the executive mansion, though presidential residence, a menacing fortified structure overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. Taylor staged his attack from the Firestone Plantation. He was confident enough of his, of his success. He announced he was occupying the mansion by early July. His men battled within 500 yards of the executive mansion where Joe or Doe had holed up with his men. That was far as he would get. As a two-child trader, mortar, and small arms fighter, Taylor suddenly called a halt to the operation. The United States had reached out to plead to him for peace. Conan, and we gotta talk about Conan, Steve Coley talks about him too. The State Department tops of African hand, talked with Taylor several times by satellite phones to negotiate a ceasefire. He even visited Taylor at a rear guard base in the Ivory Coast. Now we know the Ivory Coast is ran by the French. You know what I'm saying? So the French had their play in this too. Matter of fact, the president of the Ivory Coast, he just got out of the Hague not too long ago because they were trying to hit him with war crimes. You know what I'm saying? Even though the white man getting all the money out this stuff and others, you're going to find out later on in other parts, the black faces on there take the fall. So he got a rear guard base in the Ivory Coast where he found Taylor sitting on, on a throne surrounded by child soldiers. Behind him was a portrait of John F. Kennedy and his wife, Jackson. He had visions of being in great statements, Conan said. He saw himself like that. I'm going to take over Liberia and make it to a new country. The bid for peace failed. Liberia faded 
further into concern for the United States. Horn and his appears made that clear to him. The feeling was that we didn't have to have Liberia as our Dr. Child, Conan said. We were not going to take charge of Liberia. Into the void stepped in a West African nations led by Nigeria, the regional heavyweight. In August 1990, the Alliance deployed some 7,000 peace cars known as Ikamad. The peacekeepers succeeded in Halton Taylor and had saved the Liberian president, Doe. Doe was captured and killed by heads of a rival rebel, 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 rebel faction led by Prince Johnson, one of Taylor's former generals. A notorious, vicious drunk, Johnson had himself filmed as he ordered the men to torture Doe, while he sat behind a desk with two open cans of Budweiser beer and young women fanning him from behind. Johnson ordered his men to strip Doe. The portly president kneeled before Johnson in his underwear, quivering, sovereign, bagging. Johnson's men hacked off his ears, blood poured down his torso. Doe's body was later found dumped outside of a medical clinic. Amos Sawyer, a Liberian intellectual who emerged as the president of the interim government, named at the meeting of, of leading Liberian politicians and activists and religious leaders. By November, an uneasy ceasefire had settled across the countries. Liberians had called no peace, no war. Taylor, unimpressed by the peacekeepers and the new interim government, went about the business of governing. He now controlled most of all of Liberia. In a typical grandiose fashion, Taylor named his territory Greater Liberia, thought it would be better known for his ever nickname, Taylor Lang. He declared himself president. As he, in his capital, he chose the village of Gabanga in the flatlands of, the, of northern Liberia, a scruffy regional trade center. Taylor had a long and low single house, single salary house on an airy hill overlooking the village into his executive mansion. From the outside, it was modest and pretentious. Inside was a residential furniture and walls of burnished wood. He formed a legislative body for Taylorland, the National Patriotic Reconstruction Assembly Government, or the NPRAG. He appointed cabinet minister, frequently fired and sometimes beaten, in creating a judicial system, hardly independent. He even hired a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. He also built his army. Imagine perhaps 10,000 fighters and child soldiers armed with machine guns, mortar, and artillery cannon. His dreams sketched widely as the Liberian sky. I am not a soldier. I am an economics. I came here believing in the very democratic principle the United States is built on today, he told television cameras. All I want to do is bring back some sanity and some fair play in the country. For a while, a group of Firestone Liberian managers worked with Taylor to run the plantation but they couldn't maintain the millions of rubber trees. They had no ships to transport the rubber, no sales network to sell it, and the farm hydroelectric, hydroelectric plants supply electricity only haphazardly. By February 1991, the plantation was in danger of falling apart. A group of Firestone workers met Taylor on the veneer of House 53. Their message, they want Firestone Black. The employees were not benefiting, said Victor Bestman, Liberians and state manager. Taylor Associates sold Reverend and risked himself, and how can they divide it? And nobody knows. Taylor grew to realize that he needs Firestone. Symbolically, the country return will almost amount to a blighted, bright neon sign indicating that Taylor and Land was open for business. Politically, his job is to supply for food to ensure the residents not to rise up in the scent. We need Firestone to keep people busy, Richardson said. When Firestone abandoned Liberia, it made Taylor see. There's a little war, then you run on, and there's no food, no medicine, complete breakdown. Taylor would later tell one Firestone in the meeting, that's inexcusable. For his own part, Firestone was in no mood to kowtow to a guerrilla leader who had threatened his managers and killed his workers. In October 1990, Emerson sent a bridgeless letter addressing Taylor as Commander-in-Chief, not President. He requested a meeting and guaranteed that the Firestone personnel who attended the meeting will be safe. A week later, Emerson followed up a AMRMR, a, a term typically used in different cable circles to outline discussion points. In it, Emerson laid out Firestone conditions for turn Liberia. At the top of the list, Firestone cannot resume operations unless his employees, both Liberian and expatriate, 
has a mission assurance that peace, law and order will be restored to Liberia and ensure their own safety and that members of their family from physical harm. Emerson demanded better financial terms to lower the company taxes liabilities. Remember, the company taxes liabilities, not the people. He noted that Firestone would not recognize the legitimacy of any political or military authority so as to avoid interfering in internal affairs of Liberia. Does this situation arise questions to whether, when, and how operations could be resumed in Liberia, Emerson wrote. Today, Emerson said he thought the company should have not attempted to negotiate with Taylor. Taylor was not recognized government of Liberia. There was no reason or language to negotiate with Taylor. Emerson said in the interview, it was only trying to figure out a way to get the plantation and resume operations. The missive did little to improve Taylor's disposition. Emerson's attitude was, we want our plantation back. We have no business there. We want everything. Our truck's back. We want this and everything else, said Richardson, Taylor's advisor. Taylor was prepared to wait. If Firestone wanted a rubber plantation back, it would have to bend and pay. The investment. Back in Akron, Emerson and the other managers began strategizing about how the plantation began running again. In 1988, the Japanese, right, the Japanese tire conglomerate, Beerstone, had required Firestone for $2.65 billion, the largest purchase of a U.S. company by the Japanese one at a time. One, a uh, Japanese one at that time. Business analysts judged the deal as a disaster. Bridgestone moved too slowly to make the necessary cuts. The company hemorrhaging money. And between 1990 and 1992, a new U.S. facility called Bridgestone Firestone lost one billion, according to one of the histories of the company. Bridgestone balance sheet, Firestone Liberian Plantation, wasn't a large item. Generation about 104 million in revenue and 15.6 million in profits in 1989, the year before the Civil War. But the 15% profit margin the plantation achieved that year was a bright spot on corporate leader ledgers down, downing in red ink. Top managers wanted a lot of pressure from Akron to get the plantation going, said Hugh Garnhart, the Firestone manager who ran the company's soda bottling plant in Monrovia. The plantation was very, very profitable. It was very efficient. The company found alternative resources of rubber in Asia after the plantation amendment, but the latex produced in Liberia was considered among the finest in the world, in part because of the company's tight control quality. The plantation supplied more than 40% of the U.S. market for latex and 10% of the world market. The value of the plantation itself, the land, the trees, the factories, the buildings, the vehicles, and equipment was estimated at nearly $200 million. If Firestone pulled off for good, those assets would be unsalvageable. Even a temporary interruption posed risk. There was no insurance that Liberia would allow the company back, especially under the favorable conditions of the original deal cut in 1926. However, to figure out how to deal with Taylor and return to, United States, and return to Liberia, Firestone had hired a young Liberian born lawyer with a precious credential. Gerald Padmore. The name sounds familiar, don't it? You know what I'm saying? We know her some Padmore before, right? You know what I'm saying? Had graduated from Yale and then Harvard Law School. He had returned to Liberia to serve as President Tober's government. As acting Minister of Finance, he sat across the table from Robert Firestone in the rubber contract negotiations. I mean, I don't know, I'm sidebar on this one. I don't know if Gerald Padmore is related to George Padmore. But um, yeah, I don't know. Some research you got to look into. Back to the story. He later switched to Firestone's side and began advising company leaders on whether to return to Liberia. Firestone agreed to have Padmore answer questions for the company about events in the early 1990s. It was a real dilemma for the company, Padmore said. There was a lot of, I would say, soul searching and really tough, tough decision making that had to be done. As Padmore saw it, there were two competing governments in Liberia, neither of which had been formally recognized by the United States. Fire, Firestone operations shut out the lines of control. The plantation sat in Taylorland, but the company shipped its rubber and latex from Monrovia. To move the plantation to port, company employees had to pass through numerous roadblocks and was sending tributes for bribes 
at each stop. Who made the rules? Who got the company taxes? Paramore said much of Firestone's determination to return to Liberia was driven by the concern of his Liberian workforce. Firestone had stopped making rice shipments to the plantation in June 1990, and so men and women and children were surviving on sugar cane and rotten bananas. During one period that fall, the company's medical director was recording 10 to 15 deaths a day, according to a sworn death physician. The plantation and the trees were also a worry. The rubber tree must be carefully attended and harvested to prevent them from dying. Firestone had received word that the Liberians had descended on the plantation to illegally harvest latex from the company trees. They were slaughtering, tapping, and the industry turned for exacting so much trap that the sap that the tree dies. We was hearing stories from our employees that they were distressed, had more risk of caught. We were hearing stories that our assets are being looted or destroyed. It is a question, do we abandon Liberia as many major businesses have done, or will there be a future? And how do we get back on? Patmore said the easy answer for fire someone had been to abandon the plantation. Several companies fled Liberia at the start of the war. Other chosen to stay, according to the State Department cables. Patmore said it was tempting for Firestone to say, we're out of here, it's risky, it's scary, and economically doesn't make sense. In a, in a sense, that would have been morally satisfying that you could safely be back in the United States. But if you felt a sense of responsibility to Liberia, and most importantly to the workers, your teammates, really the people you worked for for years who were distressed, some of them were killed, you say, let's go back and see if we can help them, Patmore continued. I think those were all good decisions because Liberia, outlast the temporary rules they may have. It's a country. It's ordinary people who live a terribly, who lives are terribly important. They do not have the ability or the means, as I fortunately did, to fly out to the United States and be safe. They got to worry about the kids. For me, it was the right choice. Stay as long as you can, Patmore said. Patmore acknowledged that Firestone employees had experienced terrible violence. His soldiers had threatened imaging. Garhart was pulled on the hit list and his personal driver had the soles of his feet cut off with machetes by Taylor's men. Firestone expats went to Taylor's fighters, savaging people in harbor. We knew they had been fighting, they had been killing, and they had been some type of some ethnic reprisal killings, Patmore said. But the time for the information available to me, and I think to Firestone, Taylor did not appear to be conducting the genocidal activities. In the interview, Emerson said that was laughable. In October 1990, Human Rights Watch reported that Taylor's soldiers had committed widespread killing and torture. Two thirds of those tried, the Quran, or the Quran, had fled the country. Those that remained, of course, said were at risk of genocide. In the early 1991, the U.S. State Department released its report on human rights violations in 1990 in a congressionally mandated assessment for every country in the world. Liberia, it read like a gore novel. All war and faction, including government soldiers, had committed atrocity. Each time Taylor took over a new province, his forces hunted and killed hundreds of men, women, and children from the Mandingo and the Karai ethnic groups, which are seen as sympathetic to Doe. Emergency food centers set up for, for food, set up for starving Liberians can grotesque snares. Those in line were forced to produce ID cards. The can were killed. In one particular nasty picture, Taylor men set up a highway checkpoint called No Return. More than 2,000 people were killed there. The overall human rights situation in Liberia in 1990 was appalling, the report read. All combatants routinely engaged in discriminant killing, abuses of civilians, looting, and ethnic based executions. All the leader of the armed groups did nothing, little or nothing, to stop the killings. In some cases, may have encouraged them or been directly responsible for the abuses. Official data painstaking compiled over the cloud years later. By the Liberian Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the testimony of a thousand Liberians attempt to quantify the human damage. By December 1990, Taylor forces alone had committed nearly 40,000 human rights violations. The toll include more than 6,400 6, killings, 800 kidnappings, 600 rapes according to a ProPublica analysis of the data. Mary Police said she was one big, was one of the victims of Taylor fighters. From the Firestone Plantation, she fled to a city held by Taylor rebels. The fire stole her food. They took her clothes. They threatened her with guns. And then one day, 
They grabbed their 13 year old daughter, raped, and killed her. Paul Lee, her husband, her son, and now her daughter was buried, went mad. I was like, something's going crazy, said Polly. She began weeping at the mirror in her living room. The Seattle's outside whirling, the sun bathing, sun beating, and I said, was not myself, oh. In Firestone, in Ohio, the Firestone executive continued to discuss what to do. Initially decided to wait and see if the comedy would resolve itself. But as those hopes faded, Firestone made his final decision. The company would go back to Liberia. Completely justifiable, Pat Morrison called the decision. Had I had a crystal ball and ability to say that what was going to happen, I would have told Firestone in January 1992, do not go back. But we didn't know what would happen. We were hopeful that good things were going to happen. He added, had Firestone the second and not taking no, taking no decisions, I think Liberia would be much worse for it today. America works for Firestone. In February 1991, Amazon flew to Liberia to reach out to Taylor over the coming months. The company resumed feeding its workers. It said shipments to rights to Taylor and the intern government. It even hired Taylor forces to guard houses 53. Taylor ignored the entreaties. Said Richardson, he just wanted to work for Light Firestone to be Firestone. In April 1991, U.S. Ambassador Peter John B. DeGoss secured a meeting with Taylor Amorino. He invited Emerson along for the journey. The boss was a proponent of Firestone and Taylor re reaching the commendation. But the U.S. government is involved now. After the meeting, a cable noted that DeVos pressed Taylor to talk to Firestone officials. We are encouraging Taylor Labor's minister, New Evan, Monica and Firestone to reach accommodation since their inactivity on the plantation benefits no one, one of the assembly official wrote to another, another cable. A news broadcast from the time showed a meeting disintegrated quickly. With the cameras rolling, Taylor received the boss in a room, an anti-room furnished with gilded white gold Louis V. Von Coach and chairs covered in plastic. Dark wood panel and rose above the red copper. Impeccable, Taylor wore a dark suit with a white pocket and a red tie. The boss, dressed in a rumpled down suit and bow tie and large square glasses, was sweating profusely. He greeted Taylor, then he introduced Emerson and Tan Fit in procession. This is Mr. Emerson, Director General of Firestone, the boss said. Taylor looked puzzled. Oh, he works for the embassy now? No, America works for him, the boss replied. Within minutes, Taylor began to harangue Emerson he questioned why Firestone was using the Port of Moravia rather than the port that he controlled. My biggest problem with Firestone is that you assist a playing economic games. They've been trying to play political games, Taylor told the U.S. ambassador at one point. The camera panned the industry who sat silent, who wore a tight smile on his face. Behind the scenes, Richardson discussed matters directly with Emerson. Richardson recalled asking Emerson to provide back pay to the workers. Richardson said Emerson denied the request. He was a very arrogant son of a what, Richardson said. Emerson told a different story. He said that when he and his team had repeatedly tried and failed to meet with Taylor, the reason Taylor ministers demanded the bride to even see the guerrilla leader. They wanted money before they would talk to us, he said. Emerson refused to pay. Looking at the concessionaire of the country of Liberia, we have been here for many years. We operated and made our taxes made taxes and given every other means of support that is legal, he told the rebels. Now you come and try to take it over the government and want us to recognize you and receive all the dues that the government should receive? If this happened, we'd be glad to work for you. That hasn't happened. By the summer of 1991, Emerson had arrived at an impasse. That is what the Firestone, that is when Firestone executives from Akron decided to pay a visit. And we're gonna stop right there, you know what I'm saying? We we'll, you know, I'll say the rest for the next part. But as you see, a lot of power when, when Firestone hooked up in Liberia, and as Steve Copley said earlier, the Honorable Steve Copley said earlier that the Boule was already in Monrovia. You know what I'm saying? You know, people that's in the know, they hear about the voice and they hear about R.R. R. Morton, but they already had people there to deal with, you know what I'm saying, that later became presidents and they themselves owned plantations. Also, like I said before earlier, if you want to read a more in-depth thing about it, 
um, pick up Alexander Cromwell. You know what I'm saying? He's a very good author. He was over there in Liberia doing things. Pick up his book and he talks about it. How the Africans from the United States that came over from the United States by the American Colonization Society went over there with a Southern type plantation mindset and created the people in the guys that pushing Christianity under the guys Christian Christianity on African people made them into slaves. And it became a caste system over there of the American Liberians versus the indigenous African population that didn't know no slavery. Anyway, this is you know Hokoski of Fun Day. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button because we dropping this in the series. And um donate some, you know, donate some chips to the moment. You know what I'm saying? Got the cash app going down. Donate some chips because we just all we doing is studying and, and writing and producing black history here. I have a wonderful one. Peace.